And so we are still moving with Nehemiah and our rebuilding series as we look at how God is rebuilding us, and not just us as a church, but, but our families and, and even our community as we step into this newer, fuller life that he has ahead of us, that he's destined for us. God is constantly growing and building us up in this relationship. So if you ever think that you've arrived, think twice, because there's more growth and more building that God wants to do in you and through you to reach other people with him, right? And, and so for that growth to really take shape, though, we need a strong foundation, Maybe you caught the news several years ago, the story, it made headlines in 2014. There was a gated community in Nevada that began to show several uh, signs of, of different homes that they were having structural problems. Their foundations were cracking. Driveways were beginning to sink and actually slide away from the homes. Cracks began to develop all around doors and, and windows. And this might be normal if they were older homes, say, you know, turn of the last century. But the oldest home in this subdivision was only nine years old, right? So the problem wasn't age. The problem was their foundation. You see, several of these homes had been built directly on top of a former landfill. In one interview, the owner takes out his tape measure and he drops it down one of the cracks outside of, of his home and and it measured about 17 feet deep, straight down. Just a few days later, he took the same measure, tape measure, same hole, same crack, measures it out, and it's 30 feet. Right? So it shows that even underground at that time, years after these homes had been built, there was this continual shift as things would decompose and then create these open cavities and sinkholes underneath the homes. Another side effect of this wonderful area was the production of methane gas. Some of the residents started to experience all sorts of the side effects that come with methane gas poisoning. Others claimed to have witnessed explosive results as they would try to burn stuff in their backyard only for these fumes to kind of capture what was going on and light the whole thing up in a spectacular way. If that wasn't enough, after finding out about some of these problems of of the houses shifting in the methane gas, local news media took the story and they started diving in and they found out that this particular former dump had had some toxic waste improperly dumped at the site. And so on top of everything else, they were now looking at groundwater contamination. And while this mess now sits in kind of this stalemate of litigation over the last several years, I, I think we can take away at least this one truth, that if you build your foundation in your home on a pile of garbage, <laughs> it won't be long until you find yourself sinking and stinking and sliding into the ground, right? Foundations matter. Foundations matter. Uh, that's what the residents of, of this subdivision learned the hard way, that foundations matter. When it comes to your home or whatever building you might be working in, there, there are some signs that you'll see that could show a faulty foundation. So you might have a faulty foundation if you have growing vertical cracks in your walls, right? You didn't know you were going to get a DYI type of deal today, right? This old house edition of the sermon. Mm -hmm. You might have a faulty foundation if your doors fail to open and close properly. I get that in my four season room. Every season, it just shifts just a little bit, right? Uh, you might have a faulty foundation if there are significant gaps around your windows or doors that start to form, and, and all sorts of things can now sneak in from the outside into your home. Or you might have a faulty foundation if you have uneven or unlevel or what they call unbalanced floors. You see, as your house shifts from what is right and true and plumb to what is not, as it sinks and as it slides you're going to experience all of these things and more. What I find interesting is that uh, much of that is true in our spiritual lives as well. Foundations matter. And so here are some signs that you might have a faulty foundation in your life. If you've noticed some vertical cracks in your life, in your relationship with, with God, if there is distance where you used to once feel close, uh, 
you might have a faulty foundation. If you've noticed that you have issues with with being open or closed in the right ways. And, and so maybe you know what God's will is for your life, and you know what He wants, but you're closed to that. Or maybe you're open to an area of sin or, or to something that is harmful or unhealthy. If you're having issues with being open and closed in the right ways, you might have a faulty foundation. If you are experiencing gaps in your judgment that have allowed certain things to just come into your life that you know are not good for you, you might have a foundation issue in your life. If, if, if you just feel unlevel or unbalanced all the time and never at peace in life, you just might have a faulty foundation. You with me? Because foundations matter. And especially when it comes to the rebuilding that God longs to do in our lives and in our families, foundations matter. And I think if we were really honest today and, and if we really got truthful I think we'd have to admit that sometimes what we build our lives on and what we choose to place as that foundation, sometimes it's a pile of garbage. Sometimes we we make the foundation of our lives feeling good. And and it's that pursuit of personal happiness above all else. And, And I like being happy. I think we all like being happy. But you know what? Emotions are so fickle, right? One minute they're up and one minute they're down. They just make a lousy foundation. Sometimes uh, we seek after pleasing others, right? And it's the foundation of seeking affirmation or validation from other people. That's a lousy foundation. Sometimes uh, the foundation is all about security, and so I'm just going to accumulate power and, and money and stuff, and it's that accumulation, right? The more piles of this stuff that I have, the better I am, but all of that stuff that we accumulate is here today and it's just gone tomorrow. Or there's a whole host of other things that our culture tries to just use as as foundations like like gender or race. Those are big ones today. The search for identity or relationships where I try to make this other person my foundation. Or careers. The, The amount of stuff that I can do or I can produce and that determines my worth and You name it, man, and we have probably tried it. And sometimes I think we've just got a lot in common with these people in Nevada. It is easy to build our lives on a pile of garbage and not even know it, and it doesn't take long before you find yourself sinking and stinking and sliding as everything comes crumbling down around you. Because foundations matter especially when we're rebuilding our lives. And and this is a truth that Nehemiah and the people really begin to open up for us. We're getting into chapter 8 today. We're skipping over a couple of chapters 6 and 7. So let me just kind of bring us back up to speed again. Now, Nehemiah was sent by the king of Persia, and he's sent back to Jerusalem. He's appointed by the king to be the new governor of, of Judah, of that region. And he's assigned this task of rebuilding this defensive wall around the city of Jerusalem and also the city itself as he ruled over that region. Now, from beginning to end, this is a total God thing, right? God opens up the ability for Nehemiah to speak to the king. God changes the king's heart so that he sends Nehemiah to do this. God provides all of the resources they need to rebuild this wall that is set decimated for like 150 years. And God moves to help the people rebuild in spite of these massive challenges they're facing, like an enemy army camped right outside their city or, or this massive internal relational conflict that we were looking at just a week ago. God kept moving and Nehemiah and the people in 52 days rebuilt this wall that had been decimated for years. I mean, it is unbelievable what they are able to do. Now, hang with me. Because as huge as this is, to build this massive two-and-a-half to three-mile defensive wall around a city, as huge as that is, building the wall was the easy part. And while God had put this in Nehemiah's heart to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, that's not all that God wanted to do. The wall was just the beginning. And I really think as you read this and as you look at this moment, I think the wall was the tool for what God really wanted to do. You see, rebuilding the wall brought God's people together. 
the challenges that they faced while they rebuilt turned their eyes back to God, God alone, who was, who was going to see them through. The wall was the tool that God used to get his people's attention, to draw them back to himself so that he could do a greater work in them. It was this work of rebuilding their lives. That's what he wanted to do. And so let me just kind of enlarge this a, a bit for us. Can I do that? Because the truth is, is that these people have been trying to rebuild their lives for about 75 years now. 70 years in captivity, and then the 70... Five years before Nehemiah gets there, they start returning that first wave of exiles coming back to Jerusalem. They're trying to rebuild what had been taken from them 70 years before. But time and time again, what they set out to rebuild just kept come crumbling down and collapsing around them. And you can really boil it down to faulty foundations. Because over these 75 years, the people tried rebuilding on everything that we've tried as a foundation relationships, politics, the accumulation of power, money, and stuff. And they, they tried worshiping other idols. They're chasing after things that are absolutely not of God, but things that promise to make them strong, things that promise to make them feel good. And maybe it did for a moment, then they felt empty. Been there, done that. And at the same time th that they're chasing all of this other stuff, they're, they're trying to figure out, okay, what can I do that's just enough to make God happy over here, right? They're doing this dance. And just like you and I, uh, you name it, they tried it as a foundation. But in the end, they felt their lives sinking and stinking and sliding away. And I think that one lesson that these people had, had failed to learn over those 75 years was one lesson that God was desperately trying to get a hold of them as they rebuilt this wall. And it's the lesson that foundations really matter. And while we get that when it comes to buildings and walls and, and things like that, the truth is that it matters even more when it comes to you and me rebuilding our lives, rebuilding our families. And so as this, this wall is, is rebuilt, there was this spiritual shift that is taking place in the people as well. And, and so they finish... Uh, on day 52, and they put that last bit of the wall back together, and, and they celebrate, and, and everybody headed off home. Uh, but just a few days later, they all returned back to Jerusalem. Uh, there was this, this drawing back, this just drawing to God in their lives that was taking place, th this calling, you could say, to rebuild their lives on Him, to make Him their foundation. And, and so now let's pick things up in Nehemiah Chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. So all the people, they came together as one in the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra, the teacher of the law, this high priest, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, their Bible, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. Now, I, I love this moment, right? Can, can you picture this in your mind? The people all gather in this, this public square, and they're coming together just for one purpose. Man, they, they just want to meet with God that's all that they want to do today. And some have traveled miles. They, they went miles back home, and they turned around and came miles back to Jerusalem for this moment. And, and they call Ezra, the, the high priest, we, we would call him like a lead pastor out of all of the pastors there, right? And, and they say, hey, Ezra, we think that, that we need an extra church service. Can we have one today? Now, did you catch that? It wasn't the pastor that was calling everybody up on the phone saying, hey, we need an extra church service today. It was the people going to get the pastor. Ezra, we, we just want to meet with God, man. We've seen him moving. Uh, there is no way we could have rebuilt this wall if it hadn't been for God. And, and now it's time for us to really rebuild our lives on him. If he can move in this way, we, we've got we've to rebuild our lives. And so Ezra, we want you to go get the Bible well, we want you to start reading it to us so that we can know how to rebuild on God and, and God's word. Now, now, we're not told exactly how long it took Ezra to recover from passing out. <laughs> right? I'm sure that the shock of people asking for an extra service was just too much for his system. Right? But after coming to his senses again, Ezra dashed off and he grabbed their Bible Right, Because back then, people didn't read. They had kind of a community Bible. You get this, right? And so he comes so that the people can hear from God, and they begin rebuilding their lives on him. Because foundations matter. That's what we read in verse 2. So on the first day of the seventh month, 
Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women, which was unusual. Normally it was just men who were going to hear, but they're like, get the whole family together. And all who were able to understand, he read it out loud from daybreak until noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of men and women and others who could understand. All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. And Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for this occasion. So again, can you, can you picture this in your mind, right? Uh, the people have gathered in this moment and really in this movement to hear God's word, to hear God speak into their lives. They're desperate for this and, and to really let his, his word become their foundation, right? Do you see that this was a major priority for them? And so they build this, this platform so that it's up and it's elevated Above them, God's word is elevated above them. God's word is spoken over their lives. And and everyone gathered and and they all show up to listen. Okay, but not for like 30 minutes or an hour. We're, We're talking like five to six hours straight that they're standing in this square from daybreak until noon. Husbands, wives, children, crying babies, right? No one is complaining about that they've missed breakfast or or that their pot roast is burning, right? Or that the game has already started. None of that mattered in this moment. Can you even imagine this? They're carving out this time and they're making this massive space for God and God's word in their lives. They just want God to speak to them and they want to hear all because they'd seen God do the miraculous and building a wall. And in response to what God had done for them, this wall, now they want God to be the foundation and the priority of their lives. And this is really the first truth that they show us to really rebuild our lives. God and his word must be prioritized. It's got to be the priority of our lives. Elevated over all other things. God is elevated above all. Right? When we make space and we make time for God in our lives so that we can hear Him speak to us through His Word. And so there's intentionality here, right? And and there's effort. Did you see the effort they put in? Right? So there's effort. There's commitment in seeking God And all of it is driven in response to what God has already done for us, right? It's a response to what he's done. So let me just pause and ask, what what has God done for you? Is it more than building a wall? I know this is dangerous to ask, but just for a moment, I want you to close your eyes. I I want you to take a trip with me, okay? So we're going to leave the United States, and we're going to head across the Pacific Ocean, and we're going to stop somewhere in the back parts of China, where people have already gathered to worship Jesus because the sun rises over there before it gets to us. Can you imagine? People all around the globe have been worshiping before we ever woke up. Many of the people in China have walked or they've biked for miles to get where they need to meet for church today. They gathered in secret, ditching people along the way, creeping around corners, making their way into a small home or maybe an apartment and they close the curtains, they draw the blinds. They don't meet with a whole lot of light. Usually they're meeting in the middle of the night. They don't want to draw attention. They're trying to live below the radar so that they don't get caught because if they're caught, they're going to be thrown into prison, re-education camps, tortured for believing in Jesus. As they meet together in this small room, in this small house, I'm talking about the size of the platform here, and there's like 30 of them huddled together. One of them pulls out a flashlight or maybe a small candle. They don't want too much light to draw attention. And they just begin reading the Bible together. Okay, but it's not like your Bible. They only have fragments. Most of them don't have a full copy of the Bible. You see, it's always confiscated. It's always ripped out of their hands every time someone's arrested. And so they're lucky if they have the Gospel of Matthew in its entirety. They're lucky if they have parts of letters like Romans or 1 Corinthians or part of Genesis. But they bring what they have and they piece it together and they try to read 
together. This is what we're doing now. We're in China and we're doing this. We're reading God's word in spite of all the persecution that they might face, that we might face. They're doing this because God's done an amazing thing. He has saved them. He's given them new life. He's given them new purpose. He's given them hope in the midst of a really hopeless situation. And now they just long to rebuild their new lives on him and his word. It's a priority. Do you see that? So they risk everything for him to hear his word. And now come back to me. How much effort do you put in to hearing God's word? I'm not trying to guilt you. I just want you to know that before you even answer that question, you've got to back up and you've got to ask yourself another one. What has God done for me? That's where it needs to begin. Because prioritizing God and His Word, it's not going to come because I get up and I give another sermon on, hey, guys, we've got to read the Bible. Right? This is basic stuff that I should not have to get up and preach. We've got to get into God's Word. It's not going to happen because Kirk gives another sermon. It's not going to happen because the church says, hey, this is something that we should be doing. It's not going to happen because we all say, yeah, that's a really good idea. That's good stuff. Those might remind us. Those might help us kickstart and maybe spur us on you know, in these short increments. But what's really going to stick and what's really going to help us prioritize God and his word is when we finally realize and it finally sinks down deep just how much of a priority you are to him. When you start to see what Jesus has done in his life and death to save you, when we see how much his grace has forgiven in our lives and how much sin he's removed so that he could give us new life in him, when we glimpse his massive love for you and for me, that is what is going to make it a priority. Because we're just reflecting back to him the priority that he makes with us. You see that? Right? And like those Israelites, our hearts are now drawn back to God. Right? And we just want to reflect that love back to him. We just want to hear him speak in, into our lives. And, and so God and his word, man, it becomes a priority. And we make space and we're going to elevate it and, and we're going to show up and listen. Because to really rebuild our lives, God and his word must be the priority. That's where Nehemiah and the people begin, but they actually show us more. So let, let's get back into this moment. So they call Ezra, they have this platform that they've built for him for this moment. Ezra's reading on this elevated platform. As he reads, everyone's listening, but there's more that's going on. So what we read. So the Levites, and, and they list them all out by name. I am going to save you the pain of me butchering about you know, these next several names in your Bible. You can try it as an experiment on your way home, okay? So the Levites instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. Uh, they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear, and they're giving meaning so that the people understood what is being read. And so as Ezra the high priest is reading, okay, can you see this again? He would read, and from time to time, he would just pause. And all throughout this, this massive crowd, there are Levites who are other pastors that are now out here, right? And they're speaking to the people around them, and they're like, hey, let me translate that for you in case, because some of them didn't speak Hebrew anymore. They'd been in exile and so they're speaking Aramaic, so they're translating. That's part of what's going on. And they're saying, you know what? Let me explain this to you. Let me break this down for you. It's kind of like this. And now they're giving illustrations, and, and they're bringing home the point of what Ezra is reading from the Bible. And so these other pastors are out here explaining it, breaking it down. And, and all across, you could just see that people are experiencing these little boom, light bulb moments as God's word and God's will becomes clear and it would click, and they would understand what is being read, what God is saying to them. And it's here that we're given the next truth, that to really rebuild our lives on God's Word, God's Word must be understood, right? It's not enough for God to speak. It's not enough that it was just written down for us. To really rebuild, we have to get the message. We have to understand. Now, uh, I'll just share with you, one of the biggest complaints about reading the Bible that I often hear as a pastor is this, Kirk, you know, I, I've tried reading it, but I just don't get it, man. I just don't get it. It is just too boring, it's too dry, it's too difficult for me to understand, so I just gave up, man, because I, 
what is with all these these and thous? Who speaks like that anyway, right? And so maybe you've heard or even said something like that, you know, and, and I'm not there to judge you on that. But this is what I would say. There's a saying in our culture, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? That's our saying. And what we mean by that is that when things get difficult, it's time to press in and get her done, right? That's what we say. What's practiced in our culture is that when the going gets tough, give up and do something easier. And we've seen that over and over and over and over and over again, from work to family to marriage, you name it. When the going gets tough, give up and do something easier. But have you ever stopped to think about how life would really be if we always gave up when things got difficult? We'd still be reading by candlelight because Thomas Edison would have given up long before he invented the light bulb. Uh, slavery would still probably be in existence in America because Abraham Lincoln would never have persisted to become president and taken that thing by the horns and wrestled it down. Uh, we would never have set foot on the moon or launched amazing things like Voyager out into the great beyond, right? Or a rover that is now driving on Mars, which just blows my mind, right? Because we would have given up at the first time a rocket blew up. Listen, greatness doesn't come by giving up. It comes by pressing in when the going gets tough. And I get that there are places in the Bible you may not understand, but you can't give up. You've got to press in. Pressing in is what we see with these Israelites. Man, they pressed in. They, they didn't give up. They, they're standing for like six hours trying to understand what God's word is, right? So this is the primary reason that we offer small groups in Sunday school classes. In case you didn't know, this is it. Because all of us, from time to time, need a little help in understanding what God's Word says and how I can apply it to my life, right? And a smaller group is, is different from a setting like this because it's difficult for me to just open it up and say, hey, what questions do you have about the Bible today, right? This, this isn't really the forum, but you have that in a smaller group. People feel more comfortable asking and receiving help, and we can encourage one another as we all grow together. This is why we have devotional books. We offer them at the Welcome Center. We give a push, oh, about once a quarter or so about the new devotional books that we have. This is why we encourage you to own a Bible translation in modern English, Right? And so get something in the New International Version. Get something in the New Living Translation. You know, the New King James Version is great too. But even better, you can pick up study Bibles or life application Bibles or a whole host of Bibles that are dedicated to helping you understand. And if you still have questions because you might, that's okay. Come to me. Come to somebody that you respect. And come one-on-one -on -one and say, hey, help me, help me find the answers to this because I just don't know what, what this is saying here. And, and together we'll figure it out. We have so many tools and so many people available to help us understand God's Word. Okay, and all of that is great, but here's the best part, if I could just give it to you. We need to remember that this really is God's Word. Yes. Yes. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy, no scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy has never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were kind of carried along by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so the same Holy Spirit that inspired men to write the Bible is the same Holy Spirit who now lives in you. If you've come to Jesus and asked him into your heart and life, you want to follow him, right? And he's the one, the Bible says, when we come to God and we pray, say, God, would you just help me understand? The Bible tells us one of the promises, one of the guarantees of God's Holy Spirit is that he's going to guide you into truth. He's going to reveal, he's going to help you understand God's word. It takes a little effort, but God's committed to you. Aren't you thankful for that? Okay, so to really rebuild our lives on this true foundation of God and, and God's word, it's got to be prioritized, right? We get that we need to understand it because here's the goal, right? We want to respond to it. It needs to produce a response in us, a response in us. Now, here's how it moved uh, the people with Nehemiah. Let's get back into this, verse 9. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and teacher of the law, and the Levites were instructing the people, and they said to them, This is a day holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the law. So as God's word was read, and it just cut 
to their heart. And they began to respond. And for them, that response was weeping. And, and, and so the question is, why? We don't know exactly what part was read to them, but this is what we know probably happened. Uh, they began weeping over sin that they saw in their lives, right? How they'd moved against God. I would imagine they began weeping as they heard of God wanting to bless them and, and love on them and, and do all these wonderful things for them. God's perfect plan for their life. And they saw that, and then they looked at where they were, and they were so far from God's dream and God's destiny that he'd spoken over them. And I, I would imagine they would weep over that. We could have been there, but we're sitting here. The proof was the broken city that still needed to be rebuilt their brothers and sisters who were still living in exile. But at the same time that they saw their sin, at the same time they saw where God wanted them to be and where they were, they also heard about this amazing thing called grace. It's this reminder as they tell them, you know, this is a holy day, don't weep today. Because this was the beginning of a holy festival. And it was a, ce a celebration, this particular festival of, of God's faithfulness, of God's care. Of God's provision. <laughs> We've got weird stuff going on. I'll try not to move. Is it this? Nothing ruins the mood. A microphone. I think I'm. Am I done? Can you still hear me? Yeah. Am I all right? It's all about God's goodness. Not just in their past. Not just in rebuilding this wall, but also in rebuilding their lives. And once again, they begin to respond faithfully and fully as they celebrated this festival. And we're going to open up more of what that looks like in the next couple of weeks. But, but for God to rebuild their lives, his word must produce a response in us. A response of a mic ripping sometimes. <laughs> it's got to produce a response in us. Seriously. And so when we come to the Bible, you've got to come open. Yes. You've got to come open to God and to his word. You've got to come open to God speaking into your life. God, I am open to you today. Yeah. And when we read this book, we've got to come ready. God, I am ready to listen and I am ready to obey whatever you, you have for me to change is going to be changed. God, I am ready and I want to respond faithfully and fully because this is not an ordinary book. That's right. This is the word of God for the people yes. of God. And when we listen, God speaks to us through this and, and we need to respond because when we respond, we're now stepping into the life, this greater life that God has destined for you. Yes. We're stepping into his life, and we begin moving forward with him as he rebuilds and he transforms our lives and our families and the people around yes, us. Yes. See, God longs to see your life and your family rebuilt into this dream and destiny that he has ahead of you. Yes. But for that to really happen, we, we've got to become a people that are, that are grounded and are rooted, mm -hmm. built up on God's word. That's right. Right? It's the priority. Yes. And we're going to press in until we understand because we want to respond faithfully and fully to God's leading. Yes. We want to live lives transformed and growing in Him and with Him. So here's the question today. How's the foundation of your life? Because foundations matter. That's right. And I don't mean this in an offensive way, but are you sitting on a pile of garbage? Are you just trying to keep things together on a faulty foundation? Or are you really building your life on God and His Word? And if you sense God speaking to you today about changing your foundation, here's the question. What does that next step look like for you? What's that next step for your family? And so maybe today that step is prioritizing God's Word. Right, so what does that look like? It, and maybe that's setting a daily time. God, this is the time, and, and, and I'm going to wake up, or when I get home from work, this is the time, and we're going to meet at this time. And this is the time that I put in my calendar so that I meet with God, and, and it becomes the priority of my life. And sometimes we just got to do that. You've got to intentionally make that space, right? It's not just going to happen. God, when I have a few minutes, 
No, 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 no. You'll always find a way to fill up those few minutes. Right. Make the time. Maybe that's your step. Maybe it's just being more intentional. God, God, I've made this time, but I'm not intentional in, in keeping to it. So I'm going to be more intentional in showing up. Or, or maybe it's setting a time for you to look at God's word with your family. Not because it's a good idea. Not because the preacher said so. But you want to do this because you know what God has done for you. You just want to respond to him. Right? That's what drives us here. That's right. Maybe today that next step is, God, I need help in understanding. I want to understand more. So what are you going to do? Right, what's your step? What action are you going to take? Are you going to pick up a devotional? Because those help. Devotional books help. Maybe it's, it's picking up a study Bible or a life application Bible. What, what's your next step? Maybe it's joining a small group or a Sunday school class or or maybe it's just that first step of praying and, and you've just never done this. Holy Spirit, would you would you help me to understand what I read today? Because God wants you to understand. It takes a little effort on our part. So what's your next step? Maybe today is that step of responding. I already know what God has spoken. Kirk, I, I've read it. I know what he wants for me to do. Today can be the day that you say yes. Yes, God, I'll step away from this. Yes, God, I will step forward into this. I know what you have for me, and I want to be open to what is good, and I want to be closed to the things that are harmful that you're leading me out of. And so I just want to say yes as you rebuild my life and my family. Because right? that's what God wants for you. He, he wants to be that strong foundation for you. Yes. So you trust him.